Thank you very much, Ryan, for that lovely introduction. And um, it's wonderful to have a clock up here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to the conference organizers. It's so exciting after all of these years. I was just talking to Suzanne Keene, who I've known for quite a while, uh, to be in a room of friends and interested colleagues. <laughs> and I will not elaborate on that. Um, <laughs> Um, perhaps over drinks, but um, uh, I'm, I, as people who know my work uh, are aware, I try to synthesize a lot of material from cognitive psychology, uh, evolutionary theory, and literature, and some aspects of literary theory. So I apologize in advance if I go over some, some things fairly quickly here. Um, uh, I have three main points that I'd like to make in forwarding the claim that there's a great deal of research that points to the centrality of the arts in human biocultural evolution, okay? And um, the talk is divided into these parts. You actually have my talk outlined, so um, um, you could see those in front of you. I'm a 19th century person. <laughs> um, research and perception, cognition, and cultural evolution all suggest that we have basic, as human base beings, excuse me, basic cognitive biases and predispositions. Among these specifically, we have a species typical way of knowing. As, as wayfinders. That would be the first point uh, that I elaborate. The second is that this species typical cognition is inseparable from or highly integrated with our cultural evolution. These are not separate things. They take place over a long period of time. <laughs> we'll have a compressed timeline. But um, cultural evolution is profoundly connected to our biological evolution. Culture includes habits, language, and customs, but also what the cognitive psychologist uh, Merlin Donald calls the gigantic cognitive web, some of it embedded in external mind. And I will elaborate on that. Point number three, reading and learning about literature enhances what Donald calls our executive function, our consciousness and awareness. Donald is very hard on those who say that um, awareness is epiphenomenal. Um, so I will elaborate that point, hopefully, with a little touching on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. <laughs> um, first of all, what is a wayfinder? My claim, my first claim, is that our fundamental way of knowing is a wayfinding cognition. All animals select habitats and um, select habitats very carefully uh, a uh, to find an ecological niche. Um, an ecological niche is a place where that species discerns, whether it's a species with a brain or not, that it can fit in and survive. And if it makes a wrong choice, we all know what happens. Um, human beings are especially adapted as wayfinders. In the words of the evolutionary psychologists John Tooby and Urban DeVore, um, we inhabit, instead of a physical niche in the world, what they metaphorically describe as the cognitive niche. We uh, uh, through our evolution, over a vast period of time, traversed great geographical areas and gathered information and learned how to build on um, that information and therefore to survive in a greater variety of habitats, um, now just um, about any known habitat. No other species can do that. That doesn't make us so great, but that makes us very different, okay? I'm not making a claim that humans are better. Um, what does wayfinding, um, that is a knowledge-seeking uh, and interpretive orientation, 
towards the world entail as uh, human beings uh, emerged evolving and nomadically through various habitats. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The baseline is a narrative mentation. Um, um, that is the construction of knowledge in a linear and causal fashion. Uh, this is supported by um, contemporary cognitive psychology, uh, the works of um, psychologists such as Jerome Bruner, Dan Lloyd, uh, Roger Shank, um, and if we want to go back to evolutionary psychology, E.O. Wilson claims that the causal rule is an epigenetic rule, that it's a built-in rule. Whether it's built-in or not, um, I am highly convinced that our primary epistemology, our primary mode of knowing is by constructing items within a narrative framework so that when you look at the world two million years ago or three million years ago, um, you're not only uh, those species, those early humans were not only thinking about what was out there, in fact, other animals are trying to um, predict the future viability of a habitat. For human beings, as conscious awareness arose, um, they're constructing that understanding within a, fra a framework that moves across time and that tries to discern causal relations between things like cloud patterns and weather. Um, so the baseline of cognition is a narrative. Um, that perceptual and cognitive orientation entails an awareness of self. Now, as human beings, we have a highly sophisticated awareness of self. But as anyone who studies ecology or evolution will tell you, even an animal without a brain has a sense of itself as an entity separated from the rest of the environment. Um, the de developmental psychologist Daniel Stern says, uh, contrary to Sigmund Freud, I'm sorry, but contrary to Sigmund Freud, that the human infant has some proto sense of self on its emergence from the womb. This becomes very sophisticated over time for us and it changes and it's narratively constructed, human beings ultimately have what is described as an autobiographical self. And if you think about that, if you think about yourself at all, hopefully we all do, you think in terms of um, not only now, what I'm doing now, and my relation to all of those things around me, who, but who I hope to be in the future, five and 10 years from now, and who I was in the past. That's what's meant by an autobiographical self. It's narratively constructed. I think it has to be, and if you have an, a, a, another sense of how we could construct that, <laughs> um, I'd be really interested in, in hearing later because we live in time, okay? So I think that's part of the basis of that um, causal narrative um, primary mode of mentation. For evolving humans, attention to objects and entities in the environment provide um, opportunities for action. Um, uh, that is, this is a term that comes out of ecological psychology and in contradistinction to stimulus response psychology, ecological psychology built on the work of uh, great 19th century psychologists like William James and John Dewey. Um, who said, you know, we don't just respond to things as they happen. The response happens in an environment, and likewise, orientation to what are called affordances in ecological psychology, opportunities for action, vary depending on uh, the context and the circumstances around you. So this idea in psychology that you can't sort of compartmentalize um, and study in isolation in the lab um, goes back uh, quite a ways. Species evolving 
in, as wayfinders in a natural environment obviously have a, a special reason to pay attention to affordances such as trees for shade, um, bodies of water um, to quench one's thirst. Blue and green are universally our favorite colors. Do you know this? <laughs> uh, those kinds of things, as well as dangerous predators, including um, perhaps most especially rival human groups, um, not just lions and tigers and things like that we tend to think about. Um, so um, habituation uh, for human beings is extremely important. That is a sense of the familiar in the environment, um, but also attention to the new and the rare, okay? And this is something else that I've um, talked about on um, the importance of novelty, the, um, the new and the rare in literature emerging from our environmental orientation. But if you're a species evolving over several several million years that moves from Africa into Asia, you are going to encounter new things. So functionally, you have to find ways to use them. So um, that is a part of our orientation um, that uh, may not be pronounced in a lot of other animals. Okay, um, how does wayfinding and knowledge gathering lead to cultural evolution? Um, good question. Okay, so now we have this really compressed timeline that I've constructed. <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm just apologize, like my students, as many times in advance for, you know, that one. Uh, this is probably a stupid question, Dr. Easterling, but um, I apologize for this compressed timeline. Uh, beginning about uh, four and a half million years ago, uh, humans began the slow transition um, uh, as arboreal animals to uh, savanna dwellers. And this evolution entailed um, an integrated uh, series of um, biological and, and um, cognitive adaptations. And it's very difficult to separate one from the other, I think. So to elaborate, uh, as we gradually came out of the vegetation into more open areas, our human ancestors, um, we became bipedal. Uh, as I understand it, this uh, very, very difficult characteristic, which itself requires a larger brain to control a lot of um, different muscle groups um, um, required by bipedalism. This took a couple million years. Um, we're talking about a relatively moderate sized animal in a habitat on the African savanna where there are um, large and fast uh, animal predators. And for that, um, as you're starting to stand up, over two million years, you know. Um, for that, you need other forms of protection rather than just running. One of the, one of the theories about bipedal uh, uh, locomotion is that it was an, actually an adaptation for running and not for walking. But um, <laughs> running still would not have been enough. Um, so a part of surviving for human beings is um, our pronounced sociality. And um, this is one of the features that is most emphasized in uh, contemporary evolutionary psychology, all areas of contemporary um, psychological study. Both Keith Oatley and Gabby Starr at the end of her lecture uh, pointed to the immense sociality uh, of our species. And that's something that I think comes into um, my discussion of literature in a minute, that we have to think of it in a, in a social way. Uh, human beings needed the glue to stay together uh, as they, they evolved in the African habitat, and sociality is that glue. And if you don't have those emotions that, um, say, keep your baby near you, um, and likewise, as um, 
a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a ten-year-old, if you don't have that emotional tie to the kinship group, then no one um, would have survived and um, been around. So we are, uh, the reason that we're so social is, is functional. Ult, um, if you look at ultimate explanations, um, that the species would not have survived without this. So we have uh, part of this integrated evolution is bipedalism and sociality, and the other part is the enlarged brain. Uh, the enlarged brain, as many of you know, I've just mentioned that that's important for bipedal locomotion, but it is also important for sociality and things like mind reading, which um, there has already been some discussion of at, at this conference. Um, you need to know beliefs, intentions, and desires, that people have beliefs, intentions, and desires, um, that they act on those beliefs, intentions, and desires. That's all part of working within the group. And it's also probably part of understanding rival uh, groups in uh, the EEA. And we use the term from evolutionary psychology, the environment of evolutionary adaptation. So um, starting about two million years ago, human beings migrated out of Africa into Java and then other parts of Asia. And you know, of course, that wasn't like taking a road trip. That was, um, I think, close to, two, close to two million years. For those better, uh, more knowledgeable in these areas, I, I apologize if any, a third apology, if any of my timeline is wrong, but it's all sort of approximate. Um, uh, but the other lecturers have also mentioned uh, the evolution of um, the arts stemming to um, at the outmost 100,000 years ago, um, the evolution of arts uh, tools that show evidence of cognitive fluidity, um, and then 30 to 60 to 30,000 years ago, the evolution of language. Part of what I'm saying about narrative epistemology is that way of thinking long predates not only language, but most certainly written literature, which is a very, very short timeline, right? Um, I think this is one reason that for literary scholars, a number of us here are literary scholars, it can be very hard to comprehend, you know, sort of like, what is this person talking about? <laughs> because written literature is just so incredibly um, recent. It's one of the things that makes it interesting. Uh, the uh, evolutionary philosopher uh, Kim Sterelny in Australia has suggested that Steve Mython is actually incorrect in saying that our cognitive fluidity only dates back to this particular time period. Uh, Sterelny suggests, well, you know, there's sort of a problem if we're look, only looking at artifacts uh, to demonstrate cognitive fluidity. That fluidity might have been there a lot longer. It's just that it's not demonstrated in anything, in anything surviving. Um, so that's, that's a, a kind of interesting. Uh, 10,000 years ago, humans, um, it took a couple thousand years but actually moved out of a nomadic lifestyle into a settled lifestyle. It was uh, accomplished for a while, for about a thousand years, and then that environment in the Fertile Crescent became depleted. So these environmental, what we would consider abuses, are not a new feature of uh, human behavior and human culture. Once you have um, settled culture, finally, you have, um, something I'm very excited about, the uh, beginning of uh, externalized mind. So um, I'm not crazy. I'm uh, drawing on the work of Merlin Donald, who is um, very influential uh, to me. Um, and we think of, um, he talks about hybrid mind and external mind, and he makes it very clear that he's not talking about distributed mind. That is, shared mind, which exists, distributed mind is shared mind, which exists out there. We support each other's thinking. External mind 
an external memory store um, is also not just uh, these computer things or these sheets of paper with words written on them, but begins with uh, 10 and 12,000 years ago, markings on trees, right? You're marking a path. That is external mind because it's, it's um, shared mind. Uh, Donald points to uh, syllabaries, I think, developing 10 or 11, um, maybe 8,000 years ago, sorry, um, as an early form of writing. Uh, he points to um, alphabet systems as extremely important because they combine uh, visual pathways for reading visual images with phonetic pathways that he says, based on um, the study of, particularly of people with disabilities, he does studies of the kind that Ram Chandran does, um, you could see that these are actually different pathways because people who have certain reading disabilities don't have those oral disabilities and vice versa. Going back to the beginning of early alphabets, you have the unification of symbolic systems with oral systems, and this is very, very important. All of this external mind is so important to us because our memories are not that great, no matter what, no matter what we think. And he says particularly short-term, short-term memory. So if you think about it, you know, um, and you go out and you go down the road, think of all the signage systems and all of the things around you that help you remember where you are. Okay, I'll tell a little personal anecdote here because it may make this more um, graphically apparent and it's appropriate to the 10 year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. But um, when I went back to New Orleans after evacuation, I turned off a main road going up to my university, a place that I'd gone a zillion times. I mean, I've been there for 25 years and I turned down the street and I didn't know where I was because the houses were destroyed and you suddenly don't know where you are. So you can think of buildings and not just road signs and not just those things, but the actual buildings as part of your external uh, mind, those things in the built environment. And when I told this story at my hairdresser, um, one of the other customers said, I'm so glad you said that because I thought I was crazy. <laughs> I didn't give her the cognitive explanation, by the way, <laughs> but I said I didn't know where I was. Okay, um, so starting about um, 2,000 years ago, right, we have um, the separation of the beginning of the separation of the arts into a separate sphere, right, which I think does a couple of different things, and the development of written literature. Um, one of the things that Merlin Donald criticizes as someone who, you know, uh, grew up in academically as an experimental psychologist, is he says we have an uh, internal mind bias. You know, we think of the mind just being inside instead of all of this outside, and um, cognitive psychology has that bias, he says. Well, obviously saying that's not really how the mind works. Well, when you have the evolution of the arts as a separate sphere, something that are not integrated into culture, and the development of reading, I think that we have our own sort of internal mind bias. We think of reading that is something that just goes in, on inside us. And, um, you know, so part of my point at the end here is going to be about pedagogy. That what we're talking about here when we talk about the humanities being important, important and how reading affects us is not just sitting and reading and um, going through the kind of process that, that Keith has talked about, but the various means of sharing this and perhaps re-socializing the experience. Because when you think about it, it really is a very social experience. Someone writes it, someone reads it. People have reading groups. They don't know what questions to ask. I've had people say this to me, you know, join my reading group. <laughs> you know, that's very interesting. Well, our conversations aren't good enough, but it is still really a social process. It's just highly attenuated. I'm jumping a little ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, how does literature promote executive function or consciousness and awareness, okay? Uh, Ellen DeSanayaka uh, suggests, and I would um, point to Gabby's 
point about not really wanting to define art as a thing. We get into a lot of problems when we try to do that. Ellen Dissanayaka is an evolutionary anthropologist. She says the arts are a form of making special. You take the everyday and you make it special. Um, they are, as a number of evolutionary psychologists and people in other fields have suggested, uh, a response to st stressful conditions in our evolutionary environment. The reason you have those cave paintings is to convey uh, information. Um, early ritual is aesthetic in many different ways, and you're talking about cultures that are highly unified, where you don't have this compartmentaliz compartmentalization of the arts into separate spheres yet. I'm sorry. Um, and the arts then are a means of trying to take control for human beings of things that seem outside control, right? Um, which is, um, I think, sort of the foundation of culture, trying to take control, you know, the whole built environment. The way since the 19th century we have created the illusion that we're separate from the natural world. That's nothing but um, a kind of crazy illusion. But the arts are integrated in that effort of um, taking control. Myth and storytelling, specifically, um, Donald suggests that the narrative impulse and the impulse towards um, a, a kind of sense-making narrative of why human beings exist, our tribal group, your tribal group, whatever, um, is um, actually the reason for the development of language. Uh, and that corresponds to what Bruner suggests about developmental psychology, that the reason little kids want to learn language is so that they can enter into the family narrative and have their say. Right? <laughs> so that's not a bad thing, but it is about power and control in various ways, right? So. Um, um, that's an interesting correspondence there between developmental psych and an evolutionary hypothesis about the origin of language. Um, the dynamics of written literature, as I've suggested, mask its participation in this cognitive web um, of hybrid mind, of mind that's both externalized and with inside us. Um, human beings are especially evolved for, Keith mentioned this a little while ago, attention sharing, consciousness, and awareness are what Donald calls executive function. Um, and so one of the things that, that humans do is um, they habituate. Uh, and most habituation studies are done on, on small infants. Hum, uh, human children habituate very quickly. What Donald says, you know, habituation means, I love this definition, learning not to attend. If something is not dangerous in your environment, if you've learned it already, you don't have to pay attention to it. So you can pay attention to new stuff. You can be conscious of what's new around you, the new information. Um, there is a sort of downside to that, and I think this plays into the function of literature, is that, you know, and I, I do relate this in some of my work to Shklovsky, that um, we come, become over-automatized, right, and, and unaware. And um, so I think one of the things that the arts can do is renew awareness by um, um, getting the executive functions um, by challenging the executive function of our minds. So I think that enhancing executive function is, should be a primary goal of um, our educational systems. I'm not really sure that I'm saying anything different from what Matthew Arnold <laughs> said in the 19th century, and I'm okay with that. But I also, I also think in the next, <laughs> You just, I, I sent something to my father about what Matthew Arnold said about economics. Uh, my father is an economic historian and demographer. And he said, wow, 
it's like it's written by someone now. I said, yeah, you know, so, but I think that our cognitive understanding can um, self-consciously inform some of the teaching strategies um, that we already use and, and help us think about it in a fine-tuning ways. So I'm not talking about, you know, so overturning our ways of reading and enhancing executive function, our engagements, but um, perhaps a more self-conscious self mode of um, approaching this that emerges from cognitive and evolutionary psychology. Um, so surprisingly, uh, you have a, uh, we have actually gotten to um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So um, I teach I teach classes at um, every level. I teach um, two-thirds of my teaching load is lower level English. I know there are high school teachers in the classroom. I'm teaching freshman composition now, and I require my students to do uh, book reports in addition to their papers because I want them to read, and they get to read their own books. Okay, I'm just giving my credentials to talk to high school teachers. Mm -hmm. And I teach a lot of sophomore level literature. Um, I teach uh, Barrett Browning in both the Women's Lit course and um, an Introduction to Poetry course. And I did not pick these sonnets because Keith was going to talk about the sonnet earlier. But um, <laughs> um, we don't usually think of narrative in the sonnet, but um, that's, that's one reason I picked it for um, both of my presentations here. Um, teaching literature, teaching literature and reading it that entire social engagement um, enhances our executive function. Okay, how? Um, there's a nice article that Ruben Sir um, published a couple years ago um, where he's talking about a much higher level seminar where he says he tries to get his students to talk about the metaphors before you know, jumping to a conceptual understanding and a categorization. That is not a risk for me with um, sophomore level undergraduates at the University of New Orleans, but I do think it's a lesson to us about um, over-intellectualizing our endeavors. So what you need to do is, yes, establish a context. And that, to me, is equivalent, equivalent to kind of establishing the environment, right? So if we think of ourselves as wayfinders constructing a narrative that's our baseline of mentation, if you take a bunch of students, you know, think of I.A. Richards and the things he said about all those reading protocols. If you take a bunch of students or a bunch of people that have no background and you throw poems at them, um, they, don't, you know, they don't get a lot out of it sometimes, right? So how much contextualization is the right amount? One of the reasons I love Barrett Browning uh, is that not only that it gives me a chance to teach a great 19th century woman, but that she was brilliant but also the sonnets from the Portuguese are a profoundly emotional experience that you can really get students who will say to you at the end of the seminar, some of them will say, some of them will just be glad it's over, but will say, I really was not a poetry person, but, you know, you taught me something about, I appreciate something here about reading poetry. So, um, you need to establish context by uh, choosing a few different things. One is a little biography, of course, of uh, Barrett Browning and her great love affair with Robert Browning, who came to her on bended knee and said, great lady, you know, it's so wonderful to meet you. Here is someone, a woman who was world famous, who was um, drug addicted because of the psychological problems she had from being so cloistered. She was one of uh, the oldest of 10 children, um, and the father did not want any of them to marry because the Moulton Barretts were a mixed race family, and so when they moved back to England, he was um, very afraid that um, any, in spite of the fact that he had 10 children, that one of the grandchildren might um, have dark skin. 
So the first piece of information as you move from to this romantic biography, a little whatever bits of it you give to these students, uh, the first piece of information that they need to look at in their wayfinding uh, narrative construction is the title Sonnets from the Portuguese. And my understanding of this is that the Portuguese is kind of a sly reference to Barrett Browning herself, who did have a rather dark skin coloration for a 19th century um, British woman. But um, I felt chastened at the end of my uh, course last semester because I would always tell students, uh, to, I would always ask them, what information are we getting from the title? That's our first piece of information, right? Whatever other context you have. Um, and just can spend a lot of time talking about the title. These sonnets are numbered, so once you get past the title of the whole cycle, um, I hope some of you have read um, all of these. Um, once you get past the title, you just have sonnet numbers. So they need to know something about that. They need to know perhaps a little bit about the Petrarchan sonnet cycle, which is a love cycle, but not a lot, you know? And um, what I do in um, these lower level classes is I always teach sonnet five, which is hard to teach without crying, but maybe that would be good for your students if you cry in front of the classroom. Um, sonnet 21, um, which uses the metaphor of the cuckoo in being asked and asking Robert Browning, say over and over that you love me, um, is somewhat comic and touching because it reflects her insecurity. So it's very different in tone from Sonnet 5, which we'll go back to. Um, it's also a sonnet that they can read without having to know, for instance, who Electra is. And um, of course, you know, whenever you ask your students if they've read any of these sonnets before, the one that they have read is Sonnet 43, which is the penultimate sonnet. Now, I remember being in high school and reading this sonnet and already not liking it, because I was like, you know, geez, it's really kind of sentimental. Well, if you take it in, as part of this process of someone who's afraid of having herself destroyed because she's never been able to love anyone and never been able to leave the house, then all of a sudden you find yourself able to go through it and say, well, she is talking about all of these different ways. And it is, I'm sorry to use the word cathartic, uh, somewhat <laughs> cathartic in that overall narrative arc that you're constructing, right? Um, in um, the sort of emotional upheaval that you feel in, in, in some of these sonnets and understanding her experience. So you don't have to teach all of sonnets for the Portuguese, but you can get uh, a lot of momentum and um, understanding and consciousness raising out of teaching three, these three. Um, the first one that I start with is, uh, as I say, probably the most difficult for the students, right? I lift my heavy heart up solemnly as once Electra her sepulchral urn, and looking in thine eyes, I overturn the ashes at thy feet. Behold and see what a great heap of grief lay hid in me, and how the red wild sparkles dimly burn through the ashen grayness. If thy foot in scorn could tread them out to darkness utterly, it might be well, perhaps. But if instead, Thou wait beside me for the wind to blow the gray dust up. Those laurels on thine head, O my beloved, will not shield thee so, that none of all the fire shall scorch and shred the hair beneath. Stand further off then, go. So, um, of course, when I teach this, I don't have to teach my students what a heavy heart is, but um, they will have a footnote that they usually have not read about Electra, and that's okay because you need to talk about it anyway. You say, look, um, here, and they already know, 
in our short biography that Elizabeth Barrett Browning had a brother who died who was very beloved to her. But I stress the point that the grief she's talking about is not just grief for bro, her brother, it's grief for her past self. She's 39 years old. She is a real old maid at this point, right? And she has never expected this to happen to her. So, so this image from mythology is of a young woman who thinks she's being presented with her brother's ashes, but it's actually her brother in disguise presenting them. Um, so then um, after that, they are able to look at this metaphor that's used of the ashes and the sparks in the ashes um, as uh, a sign of uh, not being completely dead, of remnant emotion. Um, and I say, okay, well, why sparks? You know, why, why are there, what can happen? You know, some of you probably know that terrible story. I think this was in New Jersey uh, last year. A guest in this huge um, mansion put the ashes from the fireplace in a bag out at the back door and the whole place burnt down, right? Because the sparks, the bag caught fire. So, um, and then I have to explain to them what laurel leaves are. I say, so what is she saying will happen? My um, passion will flame up and it will be uncontrollable. And you can get the students to produce this, right? In a discussion, in a discussion class, which um, I think is really important um, because um, they've, they've performed that act of interpretation. They always mention things that I have not thought about, right? And um, I'm gonna wrap up in one second. I do wanna say about, um, please read 21 when you have a, a, ch a chance. They love this sonnet, it's really very beautiful. It's a very self-reflexive um, sonnet. But how do I love thee? Uh, this one surprisingly takes time because you say, well, she's talking about all of these different ways, the height and depth, my soul can reach um, to every day's most quiet need. And uh, this comes up in a lot of the sonnets in the cycle, you know, um, that these are uh, very religious, uh, spiritual people, both of, the, both of the Brownings, but her emphasis on the everyday and the mundane and bringing those two things together. I say, yeah, but by sun and candlelight, right? So. Um, the students need to see. She's not just saying, oh, I love you in a lot of different ways. These are specific ways, and they are, and they are comprehensive. So um, my students get to help me understand this better, as I actually learned to appreciate this last sonnet once, once I'd read these others that were so fraught with very personal um, feeling. Okay, so what does this um, teach us? How does this enhance our consciousness and awareness or our executive function? Um, it promotes a cognitive and emotional consciousness of self-renewal. That you know, you could be in this, um, what seems like the end of your life for a woman in the 19th century, um, and you can become a completely different person. Um, through shared love and through the making special of aesthetic form. The fact that it entails some difficulty and some work. Um, and it's not just told to you in a sentence by someone. Somehow that is very important to us. And I think secondly, to promote the appreciation of the arts as a central feature of our hybrid mind. They are part of why um, culture evolved. They cannot be separated out from it. So if we give them up now, <laughs> I'm not really sure what that would do. Um, there are a lot of people that really do think we should just give them up, but it's an experiment that I, I think we'd be unwise to try. Thank you very much. <laughs>